آزادی بیان یعنی لون زیو فری سپیچ And here in Egypt, this is my first point, is that it's very often the case that um, national security in under Kaumi is mentioned as uh, a, a, a line not to be crossed and also not to be debated. And, and very often um, that's uh, the end of a discussion rather than a, a beginning of a, of a debate. And, and I think I, I for one, uh, uh, do, as, as, as you pointed out, very much respect some limitation on national, uh, based on national security, uh, but, but, I, give, but, but I, I think the way it is phased is, um, is very apt in the sense that I, I want constantly, as a citizen, to have the right to question Uh, these limits, and I think this this, this is what I mean by um, this becoming a beginning of a discussion rather than an end, uh, end of a discussion. I also want to make another comment here that, uh, that it's also important to engage in this debate on this particular point by making the following argument that free speech actually bolsters national security. In other words, not to pose these are two uh, opposite principles that uh, we have to choose between. Uh, and the example that I always make publicly based on my own experience as a researcher working in the archives in Egypt where um, the access to documents pertaining to our military history in the 20th century is simply uh, not allowed. The result is that uh, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, is written uh, not written without access to primary uh, information, archival information of one of the more important countries involved in that conflict. Egypt. And the result is that we have an uh, endless number of books on that conflict that use British, uh, French, American, Soviet and Israeli sources. I think that for our students and for our youth to be subjected to this lopsided kind of history is in fact a danger to our national security. And in that sense, national security in Egypt endangers national security. Uh, and and I, I think it's important to engage in these debates as citizens concerned about our national security and about religion and about privacy and about all of these principles that are very often posited as uh, limits to Um, I forgot what my question was, um, but anyway, if you can um, sh share some of your reflections based on this question posed in different countries. Can I respond to that? So first of all, something that we'll have up soon on the, uh, soon up, have up on the site is that uh, it's been a lot of work. Uh, an organization called Article 19, it's something called the Johannesburg Principles, which you might be interested in, it, which is a very sophisticated attempt to determine what legitimate limits freedom of expression on the grounds of national security might be. But there are quite sophisticated international standards out there to which one, on which one can draw, and by the way, they're not just Western standards, I mean, they've been contributed to from many sides, so that's, that's point number one. Point number two is that I think what you say is, is very important, that these are not simply balancing acts between, say, free speech and national security, free speech in public order, free speech in privacy, but to 
some extent, they are conditions for each other. Um, we have, I would guess, in Britain, I can talk about my own country, somewhat better armed forces, because there is minute scrutiny by Parliament and by the media of the um, Ministry of Defence budgets and its expenditure, and they're not very good at it, the Ministry, um, but they've become a bit better because they've under a lot of public scrutiny. So I think that would be illustrate your point in Britain. Um, if I'm just to go to privacy for one moment, the classically people think that it's a balancing act between privacy and free speech, right? This is a classic balance. But the truth is, privacy is also a precondition for free speech. Because we all speak more openly, more frankly, in private, just with a few friends, than we do if we were speaking to the whole world. And we, we all know. So if you live in a world, I mean, maybe someone doesn't, but most of us do. So if you live in a world where privacy is dead, forget it. Where all your private exchanges are at risk of being shared through Facebook, through Google, through whoever it might be, you will speak less freely. You will watch your words. That's another very good example where it's not simply privacy is dead. Forget it. But all your private exchanges are at risk of being shared through Facebook, through Google, through whoever it might be, you will speak less freely. You will watch your words. And that's another very good example where it's not simply the balancing act between two goods, but the one is also a condition for the other. Privacy is a precondition for.